Gospel of John, chapter 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 6. Today we are going to look at the miracle that is called in Bibles that have titles, the feeding of the 5,000. This is a miracle that has entered the cultural lexicon. You hear about this sort of thing in, in public uh, you know, idioms and things of this nature. The feeding of the 5,000, it is not as far up there as the walking on water, but people will, will talk about this kind of in a folklore way. But this is an actual event that happened. This is an actual event that Jesus did to show his deity to people. Now, this is the only miracle, it's the only miracle that occurs in all four Gospels. So, the Gospel writers saw this event, saw this miracle, and saw that there was weight to it. We don't necessarily build a religion about the feeding of the 5,000, but we look at it and we go, huh, I should spend some time here. I should spend something here because there is some weight because God thought it was so important, he repeated it four times. Other, gospel, other miracles, very few are three, two times, a lot are just one time in the gospel that Matthew thought this was important, Luke thought this was important. Everybody thought that this was important. And so, how do we get to it? How does this miracle come to be? This is one of those miracles in which Jesus caused the need. If you are looking at this from 30,000 feet, as we can, it's very easy. We don't want to say things like this about Jesus in a negative way, but he set up the situation. He set up the people to be in the need to be hungry, and then he fed them. So Jesus caused this visibly in this situation. You look at the healing of Jairus' daughter, and that seems apart from Jesus. Uh, yes, God is sovereign over sickness, but Jairus' daughter is over here. Jesus is over here. He goes and heals the daughter that's over here. He didn't cause the situation. Jesus actually caused this situation. And we shall look at this. Jesus had been teaching, and if you look at your Bibles, it says John 6. There's a big 6 there. If you turn the page back, one, there's a big five there, okay? John 6 comes after John 5. It says, after this, what is this? This is chapter 6 versus chapter 5. These verse numbers and chapter numbers were put in much after Jesus, but they picked a good place because chapter 5 takes place, we believe, at the Feast of the Tabernacles, while this chapter 6 takes place, it says, uh, at the Passover. And so if you look at your Jewish calendar, you see they're five and a half months apart. So from the last verse of chapter 5 to the first verse of chapter 6, it's five and a half months. We can say this because they tell us about festivals. And Jesus has a massive crowd, if you're looking at the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, as it's called. He's on the left-hand side of it. There's a big crowd, and Jesus wants to get away. Jesus wants to either spread the word, or the people are just too much for him, so he can't find even a place to rest and sleep. And so, he gets in a boat. It says, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And we, we believe, it doesn't say, but we believe he probably got into a boat. In other places, when he goes to the other side, he gets into a boat. So he probably didn't walk around. He probably got in a boat and went straight across. Now, people saw him, saw him get into the boat. And they tried to follow him, but the boat pulls away. Now, a few probably got into a boat and tried to follow him, but the others went around. You can see on the lake, you can probably see Jesus' boat because he's going along in the north part, no matter where you are along. And so a crowd was following the boat along the northern shore while Jesus is taking the direct route. And... 
they're picking up people, they're gathering people as, as the crowd is going. People are saying, where are you going? What are you looking at? And they say, I'm looking for Jesus. Jesus there. We're going to meet him on the other side. And they say, Jesus, why? And they all, you know, and the crowd gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Thousands of people, at least 5,000, it says here. And so they're going to the other side. Now, Jesus gets there first, and he goes up to the mountain in verse 3. And he sat down with his disciples. Some private time with his disciples. If you look at a modern map, if you look at a uh, overlay, there are maps that overlay Bible stuff on top of modern stuff. That mountain that he is going up is today known as the Golan Heights. Okay, you say, huh, Golan Heights, where do I know that? Most of the six-day war that uh, Israel fought against Syria in 1967 was fought on top of that mountain that Jesus was there with his disciples. And so that's just showing how things are important even today that were important back then. Back then it was just a quiet place and Jesus perhaps prayed, perhaps taught his disciples, perhaps asked him some questions. They asked questions and he answered them. It was a, a private group time of Jesus and the Twelve. And this took enough time that the crowds finally caught up with him. And so he looks down the, the, the little hill that he's on, and the crowd is just a sea of people, just, just big people. Now, Jesus knew that the people would follow him. If you look at a map today, even the Golan Heights is deserted, okay? It's a grassy place during the winter. It is a brown place during the summer. And nobody really lives there. It is kind of a pasture land. And it's a wide expanse of a pasture land. And back then it would be even more deserted. I mean, today you can get in your car and drive there. But back then you had to walk as Jesus did. And these people had walked most of the day. And the crowd got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's implied that they are far enough away that it, <coughs> it would be difficult for the group to go and find a restaurant, find a market, get some food uh, for the day, for their one meal of the day, which most people in the poor and subsistence farming area of this ate one meal a day. And so in Mark 6, it says that Jesus saw them and had compassion on them. He had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And that is a phrase that is used by Jesus on three different occasions when looking at Israel. They are like sheep without a shepherd. And what does he mean by that? That is a spiritual statement. That is a statement about their their spiritual state, okay? Spiritually, we are all like sheep who have gone astray. We are not all physically walking around aimlessly, but spiritually, everybody, one time or another, will follow this shiny object or that shiny object or this thing or that thing. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, we stray from what God has for us, and he pulls us back. And so he is saying that this group of thousands of people <clears throat> have no teacher, have no person telling them the truth about God. If you read about the Pharisees and the priests at this time, they were presenting a self-advancing, very selfish sort of religion where People had to give them lots of things for them to be considered saved. They had no true teacher. Now, if you read through the Gospels, you can think maybe somebody like Nicodemus. He was probably a true teacher, but that's about it of the Pharisee class. And so Jesus knows that they've been told lies, that they've been told uh, work harder, that they've been told things that actually pull them further away from God than bring them closer to God, and he has compassion on them. And the, the compassion is, he knows the truth. 
He is a true teacher, and he wants to teach them the truth about God. And so he, uh, in, in verse 5 through 9, after he's on the mountain and he sees the group, he then says to Philip, and he's playing with Philip. It says in 6 that he's doing it to test him, and so he doesn't want Philip to fix it. He wants Philip to understand. This is a teaching moment. This is a testing moment. He says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Okay? He could have just done the miracle, but he wants to bring the disciples along. And he picked out Philip. And Philip, he said to the test for he knew what he would do. And Philip an answered, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. A denarii is a day's wages for a common la laborer. So 200 of those is about eight months. If you, t if you worked and every little dime you got, you put in the bank. Didn't spend anything on anything. Starved yourself while you're putting stuff in the bank. If you amassed eight months worth of money and brought it, that would not be enough bread, he says, to give even just a little crumb to each of the thousands of people. And so Jesus knows this. He was kind of expecting, I guess, for Philip to have more of a faith-filled statement. Philip could have said, for example, that I saw you uh, heal Jairus' daughter. I saw you heal the paralytic that was let down from the ceiling. I saw you heal the woman who had the issue of blood. I've seen you cast out demons. I've seen you heal leprosy. What are you going to do now, Jesus? You clearly can take care of this. But instead, he looks at it from a pocketbook sort of way. And he says, each of them to get a little. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, I found a boy who has five loaves of barley and two fish. This type of food is... Some people call it poverty food. Back in those days, your primary bread was wheat. You wanted to make bread out of wheat. You would also grow barley. Barley would have been packed, the dough in a, in a tight ball, and then baked in an oven and then given to pigs. And pigs would chew on it, and it would give them enough nutrition and for humans to eat it, barley dough was gritty, it wasn't fine ground, and so it was difficult to eat. The fish was probably dried. Today we might call it fish jerky, okay? But it's, it's just dried out in the sun, and that way you could travel with it. You salt it, and you dry it, and then you can put these things in a bag. And this boy could do it. Now, this says... When you look at this, you say, okay, it's poverty food. It's food that may have been meant for pigs, but the boy got it somehow. But he's the only one who has a snack, and so he's the richest guy there. It's not like they're lining up people who brought their bag lunch. This is the only one who did. Now, there may be people who are hiding food, but the general consensus is... Out of the thousands of people, as the murmuring is going through, do you have any food, do you have any food, do you have any food? The boy is the only one who has any. And Jesus says, all right, that's what we're going to use. Have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so this is probably springtime. Of course, it says Passover. Your Passover is anywhere from very late February to very early April, okay? So Passover is in that range. And so you would have grass. Things haven't turned brown yet. It hadn't gotten hot in the middle of the desert. And so they sit down. And it says in other Gospels that they sat down by 50s and 100s. And you look at the Old Testament, whenever there's a large group, when Moses is talking to the people and the manna is going to come out and he's explaining the law, they're sitting by 
50s and 100s, okay? It seems to be a very common way for the people back then to divide themselves, so it's easy to count. I don't know, today when you have that many people in a, you know, in a stadium, you can have 75,000 people in a football stadium, they just sit there. They don't sit there by 50s or 100s. But that's how they're doing things. And so one thought that I have, and I don't think that it is important for this, but this took a lot of time. Okay, It took a lot of time for the things to murmur through because it says that there are 5,000 men. And in the other Gospels it said, besides the women and children. Now, if you had a family with 6 or 8 or 10 or 12 kids and the husband and wife are following Jesus, they're not going to leave the kids to fend for themselves. They're going to bring the whole family along. That is how things were done. This is not one of those sorts of things where only the men went and the women folk stayed home. Everybody followed Jesus. There is examples of Jesus healing women. There's examples of Jesus referring to children. The whole family was following Jesus. And as the crowd was moving through the villages and saying, come on with us, you would have women and children, whole family units coming. And so the demographics of the day, it says if there's 5,000 men, you probably have 25,000 people. Okay, it's called Feeding of the 5,000. The title I gave was Feeding of the More Than 5,000 because you probably have 25,000 people in this big field and they're divided by 50s and 100s. And just to get that done probably would have taken, you know, an hour to get them to do that. It says in Mark that it was evening. It says in Luke that it was getting late. What time was it? In Jewish thought, they kind of block off things by three-hour segments, okay? And so you have the third hour, the first hour, that's a three-hour block. And so when it's evening, evening is 3 to 6 p.m., Okay, so it's afternoon, 3 o'clock, all the way up to 6 o'clock, which we would say even today that is beginning to be evening. It's not night. Night is later. This is evening, okay? And so it's beginning to get dark, and people wouldn't be able to go here or there. They have the same sort of thing that we have, is that during your Februarys and Marches, your days are shorter during your Junes and Julys your days are longer. They were in a shorter day time. And so three to six, it was, you know, you could, you could, the sun's, you know, going down. You can see it right there. And so he begins to distribute the fish and the loaves. And it doesn't say how he does it. When we look at this, we go, how did Jesus pull off this miracle? It doesn't say. We don't know when the miracle took place. We don't know if Jesus stood there with a barley loaf and pulled off a piece 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 and pulled off a thousand pieces. Okay? We don't know that. We don't know if he broke it in half and gave it to his disciples. And when the disciples started to break off pieces, the barley loaf never ended. Okay? However it was done when the food was broken into pieces so that people could get a chunk of barley and a chunk of fish, those never seemed to run out, whoever's hands that was. We do not know when Jesus did it in this. We do not know how he did it. It is clearly uh, when you categorize uh, miracles, this is called a creation miracle because he made more barley than there was, and he made more fish than there was. And so he created stuff. This is something that only God can do when we talk about creation. When we talk about what creation is, um, I've referred to a new telescope. There's a new telescope. It is called the Webb Telescope, because apparently a guy named Webb figured out how to do it. It was sent up on a rocket, and it unfolded in space. And it's looking farther into the universe than we've ever looked before. Uh, they're saying that it takes, you know, from 12 hours to 4 days 
to get a photograph because the light way out there is very faint. But they're now talking about you know, how many of this, how many stars and how many galaxies and how many things we have. And you just stand in awe of what God did because he didn't have to do that. Okay, When God created, he really created and he made a big thing. And we can just stand and that should cause us to be in awe of what God has done, and He did it for His glory and for our pleasure. And so, you can go to nasa.gov and see all the pictures and, and be amazed at what God has done to show you. And so, this is being uh, distributed, and the stuff is being handed out, and however they hand it out, there's always more to hand out. And it says that they, they had their fill. It says, and when they had eaten their fill. Now the word fill means, we would say today, Thanksgiving full. Okay? We all have that sort of idea of eating because it's so good you don't want to stop until you get so full you can't get out of the chair. Okay? It is that sort of. It isn't as far as gorged, but it is fully satiated, okay? They could not eat another bite. Everybody there, 25,000 people, had a full meal. Now, they hadn't eaten all day. They probably hadn't eaten since sundown the day before. So we're getting close to 24 hours without eating. And they ate until they could eat no more. That is the volume of food that was created. For 25,000 people to say, oh, I, I just couldn't. I just, oh, oh, pie? I can do that. Well, I just couldn't. And they just ate and ate and ate. And then Jesus said, pick up the fragments, pick up the pieces, because somebody might be handed a, a chunk of barley, and they take a bite, and then it slips out of their hand and falls to the ground. But hey, there's another one over here. And so they take that, and they keep eating, and they don't have to be careful because there seems to be a bunch of food, and they're not going to run out. And so there's food on the ground, and so the disciples go, and they collect all the fragments, and they put it into baskets, and it filled 12 baskets. Now, some people go, huh, wonder what that means. But if you look, hey, wait a minute, there's 12 disciples that had no faith. Now they get to walk all the way back to town, with a basket full of barley and fish. And the idea probably is that they would leave the grassy area, go back into town, and the disciples would now feed the people in the town, okay, by their hand, because there had been so much food created. There isn't the sense that they were now going to hoard it they probably shared it when they went into town, but each disciple gets to walk the four miles carrying this basket, and that might kind of get in their head that, wait a minute, Jesus can do amazing things because I'm carrying this rather heavy basket of stuff that Jesus did. And so the people look at this, and they say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When they say the prophet, capital T, capital P, that is an Old Testament prophecy. Moses in Deuteronomy 18, when he is talking about the future and what God is going to do, Moses says God will send a prophet like me, Moses says, who will come and teach you all righteousness. And so that became a a folklore that became an idiom for Messiah. And so the people in Jesus' day were told the story that Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 18 about this prophet, and they were told it as children's stories, and so they grew up believing that there was going to be this, the prophet, capital T, capital P, would be sent by God, would be anointed by God, would have the power of God. And so they are making a correct assessment here that this is uh, somebody important sent by God. 
Now, people who study this, John MacArthur, for example, says the vast majority of these people were thrill seekers. They were there because Jesus did some neat tricks. But there were some who saw who Jesus was, who put two and two together from the Old Testament, who believed he was sent by God and gained a saving faith and a full stomach because of that. Now, the whole crew in 15, it says, perceiving that when they were about to come and make him king by force, Jesus withdrew again. Now, consider this. This is a statement of human nature, and human nature does not change. You have a guy, okay? I am starving most days if I am living back then. I may have a little farm that may have wheat, but in the off months, I have no wheat to eat, okay? And if I didn't save enough, I will be hungry most days. Most people back in Jesus' day around the Sea of Galilee were hungry most days. Very few, according to the records, died of starvation, but they were all skinny because they were all hungry most days. Here's a guy who gives you free food, as much as you can eat. You go to the grocery store today, and those eggs are 25 bucks. Jesus is going to give you free eggs. Jesus is going to give you free beef, free stuff. He won't give you bacon because he's Jewish. He'll give you free stuff. All that you can eat, all you have to do is get up in the morning and there'll be a box of food on your porch and it will last all day and I will be full. That's what their thinking is and that's what we think today. If you're a politician and you promise a car in every garage and a chicken in every pot, the next guy is going to say, two cars in every garage and two chickens in every pot. And he's going to get elected because he's going to give you free stuff. They wanted free stuff. They wanted free food. They wanted somebody who just by snapping their fingers can take care of all my needs. And think if that guy's the king. He can do anything in his kingdom. But Jesus withdrew because Jesus' goal is not to be king their way. Jesus' goal was to die for your sins and get the crown in heaven after his resurrection and ascension. Jesus is coming again, and when he comes again, he will come at that time as king. And he may give us free food for the rest of eternity. I don't know. But he is the king his way. He is not the king our way. And so the, if you look at the Bible, the greatest miracle in the whole Bible is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Apart from the resurrection, we are miserable. The second, I would say, is this, feeding of the 5,000. It affected, it impacted more people for a longer period of time than any miracle. It hit the whole northern part of the Sea of Galilee, every one of those 25,000 are going to disperse and perhaps bring a piece of barley bread with them and talk about what Jesus did and how Jesus fed them thousands of people out in the middle of nowhere. And so the impact of this, I think, is why it is in all four Gospels. Because if you're looking for something that shows Jesus' compassion, His love, His power... It is this miracle. Jesus fed the 5,000. From this, we are supposed to understand that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. We know from the rest of the gospel that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose on the third day. And today he's standing at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And someday he is coming again. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just praise you for the miracles you performed and for this miracle. We just praise you that you are one who has compassion on us. You are one who takes care of our needs. And yet you are God Almighty. You are more powerful than we can even imagine. Lord, we praise you for that. 
and ask your blessing on the remainder of the day. We ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen.